Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros back with the Yo Elliot show. And today I got my guest JP Sears, an old friend and also a very popular comedian. I wouldn't have introduced you that way, like maybe 10 years ago, but uh, he's become, well, the comedian part. Uh, he was popular in my mind when I first learned about him. Uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a Czech student, and uh, I was a big Czech fan. Uh, but recently, he's had millions of people follow him on all platforms. And, uh, and I was thinking on my way up here, Jay, that like being a comedian now is not much different than being the genius you were before. You got to be pretty smart to tell good jokes. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and of course, I'm biased. I'm going to agree with any sentiment that suggests I'm smart. But uh, with that said, for sure, I, I think the number one principle in comedy that at least I try to live by is the truth principle. And ideally, using comedy to unveil a truth that's not obvious. And then when you look at the health world, what we would do in the the check systems, it's basically looking for a truth about the body that's not obvious. You know, someone's got some kind of problem going on, their shoulder hurts, but the shoulder's been treated and the shoulder's not being helped. You're looking for what's there that's not obvious. And I think comedy, when it comes to shining the light of awareness on truth, is basically that same pattern. It's huh. just done through the language of comedy rather than the language of physical bodily interactions. So I, th I think there's definitely some common ground there. You're like diagnosing what's going on and just pointing it out in a way that's digestible for people or entertaining. Almost like I was thinking about the court jester, right? Like mm. the court jester is the guy that can like, he can tell the king if he's not a tyrant, a a high chair tyrant who will kill him like vice news but we'll talk about that in a minute uh he could tell him like you know how he's screwing up but in a fun and lighthearted way where everybody kind of laughs see it's kind of like the satire that you do right yeah a hundred percent the court jester i do think that's my role in society right now and there's obviously multiple court jesters but uh i think my role is to be one of them and you know, an unchecked king, when the, he doesn't have the court jester pointing out through comedy uh, the king's egotistical nature, then the, the king will become a tyrant. It's just a fact of life because the king is a human being. He's got an ego. Yes, he has the intention to serve the kingdom, but also he's a freaking human being. That's why we all need to laugh at ourselves. That's why we need to laugh at the the tyrants that are um, in the world today, because if the king can laugh at himself, we're in good hands. If the king can't laugh at himself, 
that which he will not laugh at will negatively impact our lives. And it seems like that's where we are right now as a society, right? Like there was a time when the comedian could say what he needed to say and it was okay. But uh, now like you can be canceled. <laughs> uh, recently you were uh, attacked by Vice News. Not that it even matters because I think they're bankrupt now, but what was that as all of about? Today, <laughs> as of today, Vice announced they're going bankrupt. I think like two weeks after they put out that smear piece on me. So I couldn't think that's more hilarious. <laughs> uh, to be honest. <laughs> but, Off with his head. But yeah, Vice, you, you asked what that's about. You know, Vice News, it's, I, I don't mean to sound like a some kind of lunatic here, but objectively they're a, a leftist propaganda outlet. And uh, they decided to write a hit piece on me, which I was honored by. I, I couldn't have been more amused. Some of what they said was actually true, which was great. They're just framing that in a negative light of like, oh, he, he's, he believes in these conspiracy theories. Like, yeah, a lot of those are fucking true. <laughs> so, you know, they, their hit piece it, it, it summarized was JP's a racist, transphobic, anti-vaxxer, um, you know, just all the traditional smears, same play out of the same playbook. And they went on to, you know, smear uh, along with me, Dr. Robert Malone, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's like uh, Dr. Mercola. I'm like, do that. Nice. Is good You're a good company. That, that, that's why it was a compliment. Huh. And so they also pointed out that, uh, like myself, you and I, we have a lot of we have a lot in common. We're not the same, but we have a lot in common, a lot of th common threads. And one is this shift from like being a new ager to being a Christian. Um, tell us about that. Like that they're not wrong. You were a hippie as was I. And, uh, and now you're not T talk about the hippie stage. Yeah, man. The, yeah. My hippie stage. And I don't know if I rivaled you and your hippie intensity. Well, you still got the long hair, bro. I'm monk now. Well, thank you. I, I, that's still hippie like. like. Well, Jesus had long hair, so I guess you're Jesus. a good company. Yeah. <laughs> and you're rocking more of the Buddhist look. But yeah, you know, my hippie stage, when I was, what the heck was I, 23, I'm 42 now. I moved from Ohio out to Southern California uh, to work with a uh, man we both know. He's a mentor of mine, Paul Check. Moved out, I was 23, North County, San Diego, Encinitas. That is basically the hippie capital of the world. New age, a lot of spirituality there. So I, I got into it. And man, I honestly had a lot of good come from it. There's some perspectives that I still very much hold near and dear to me. In the 10 years that I lived there, I can now recognize, oh, even in the new age movement, there is propaganda. And it's not just like, hey, this is new age propaganda. There's propaganda in there that to me looks very Marxist, mm -hmm. looks like it's very communist subversion. And part of that propaganda is to brainwash the new agers to think you're enlightened if you're spiritual, but religious people, man, they're just dogmatic. They're, they're basically stupid. They're stuck in the old paradigm. I fell for a lot of that propaganda, to be honest with you. And now as I'm growing, maturing, shedding some of my own skin, I'm able to see some of the propaganda that was that I allowed to be lodged in my brain. And part of that propaganda is believing that religions, Christianity is old, outdated, just garbage. So uh, I I'm starting to realize there's so much in the way of Christian values that uh, I can get a lot out of. They make a lot more sense to me now. And not only am I working on unbrainwashing myself, the past handful of years, but I've also become a father yeah. that certainly <laughs> wakes something up inside yeah. of me where Christian values, they're just, it's ridiculous not to see right. the beauty in them, especially when you're a father. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've been waking up and, and kind of like the hero's journey, returning home of like, you know, I left the home of Christianity. I was raised Catholic 
and now seeing like, man, there is so much good in this. And I think there's some deliberate attempt to hide it from mm -hmm. people. No surprise, you know, communism 101, disconnect people from God. Right. So uh, I definitely fell for a lot of that. But man, it, it feels good to basically reclaim my own thinking when it comes to my relationship with God. And I'll, I'll just say this because it was a, a big piece that tripped me up. I would look at things like, you know, the, the pedophile scandals in the Catholic Church and like use that as a reason to discount all of religions. But it's now I like, obviously, those guys are scumbags. Right. I hope they rot in prison. But you look at anything beautiful, any movement that's beautiful, and evil will infiltrate each movement. You know, the mm -hmm. devil, devil masquerades as an angel in disguise. So I realized, you know, I, I threw some of the bathwater out with the baby yeah. or the baby with the bathwater. I threw it all out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a little bit of where I've been with the, the New Age movement. And um, a lot more could be said, but yeah, that's the gist of it. Well, you know, one of the things that we do have in common, and I congratulate you for being a lot like me in this way, <laughs> is your willingness to change. True narcissist. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. You're mirroring me, so I like that. Yeah, so uh, your willingness to change, right? Like a lot of people, you even said it in that video. I mean, what inspired me, you know, you sent me that Vice uh, link and I was like, oh yeah, they're going after JP, it makes sense. But I had also seen your Got God video and uh, and you mentioned that like, you know, your willingness to change and like the really the thing that makes most people uh, suffer is their unwillingness to change. But there's some sort of virtue, I guess, in that I've always been this way. I've always like, I think Ralph Waldo Emerson said that the f a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of uh, knaves and, and other not good people. But yeah, this is foolish consistency. I wanted to backtrack real quick, though, and continue along the lines of like the new age stuff, because, you know, I, like yourself, have reverted and come back to Christ. And as a result, I started to do some investigation as to what the new age was all about. Are you familiar with like Madame Blavatsky and uh, and her, have you heard that name before? No, I okay. haven't. She was heavily involved with Freemasonry and uh, they worked together. They, there was a, a, a publication that they ran for several years called Lucifer. And uh, through uh, Blavatsky in particular, she worked with guys like Aleister Crowley. Uh, their intention uh, along with the Freemasons was to remove Christendom, was to destroy the West by destroying the church. Because they knew that in any, even if you think of the Western civilization as a family, they understood that you got to take out the father. If you're going to destroy a civilization, you take out the father. You can take out a family, you take out the father. And so they knew that they were going to need to destroy Christendom. And a part of the way they destroyed Christendom was the infiltration into the church that created all the pedophiles. We'll talk about that in a moment. But... <laughs> on the new age stuff, they knew that if they removed, uh, if they removed religion, they were going to have to replace it with something. And so they wanted to create this, uh, this sort of mishmash, pick and choose, uh, cafeteria line religion where it was like, let's, let's. And so they were very instrumental in bringing like Buddhism and Hinduism and like all these Eastern religions into the West, which, you know, there was some value there, and I'm grateful that I learned about that stuff. Alan Watts was huge to me, but their intentions were specifically to supplant, namely the Catholic Church, because it was what built Western civilization. And then on the infiltration part, in the 1950s, they threw this woman named Abella Dodd, and if you do a little bit of research on her, uh, she speaks of how they had a deliberate infiltration into the church with Marxists and homosexuals in order to destroy it from within. And this is all spelled out, their whole plan is spelled out in a document called the Alta Vendita. Wow, man, well, not surprising. And, it, it, and that's news to me, but not surprising to hear. And man, yeah, I, it's kind of like what I'm hearing you say, it's kind of like if you wanna weaken a population, 
you got to get them off of eating healthy, whole, vital foods. But you got to replace that with something. So in comes the junk food. And of course, there's some level of nutrients and junk right. food, some level of benefit. Obviously, it's a net detriment, but it sounds like that's basically that same thing. And I, I'd be very interested in checking out those resources you mentioned. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Um, <laughs> there's so much cool stuff to dive into. But yeah, the new age uh, gives us this sense of uh, pro progress this sense of yeah. evolution and then you know i remember listening in one of your videos you were talking about how it gave you this sense you know sort of a spiritual ego that well you know those old religious type people they're kind of trapped in the in the old and like the new age is like well we're evolved and we, we yeah. we're kind of with it meanwhile you're archaic not remembering that like god is god no matter what time it is <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the biggest detriments that I see in the New Age movement is in a roundabout way, if not a direct way, depending on the teaching, it, it advocates for you to think of yourself as God. Mm -hmm. And and one of the I started doing comedy videos calling out the ego in the spiritual New Age world. And of course, I was guilty as charged of all of that. But it makes sense, like why there is just so much damn ego in the New Age world, because people really start to think of themselves as their God. And I'm all about like honor thyself. That's important. But if you don't have the humbleness to realize and the awareness to connect to and then the courage to live uh, how you're being guided to actual God, you know, you're you're disconnected, man. Yeah. And, and you think you're very connected, but what you really are is connected to your own ego. And that's what you worship. That's what you serve. And I think that's a problem. That's right. certainly one of the detriments. It becomes a subjective religion, a religion of one. Uh, and so my question is like, you know, subjectivism is so seductive because it's whatever I feel is what is. Uh, if I feel like I'm a woman, you know, then, well, I am, and you must abide by my uh, mania. Um, my question for you is, do you believe, and of course I'd love to dive into Christianity with you, but do you believe that there is an objective truth, there's objective morality, that there is a right and wrong? Yeah, I do. You know, I, I think the distinction between absolute truth and relative truth is very important. And the absolute truth would be the objective truth. That's what comes from God. Like that's God's way. It is just eternal, omniscient. And then I think there's the relative truth, which would be based on our opinions. They would be based on what I feel, what my perception tells me is the accurate view of the world, which may or may not be accurate, so I think a humble mind is one that can say literally everything I say and think as a human is relative truth. The absolute truth, that comes from God. I can't control that. God gave me the absolute truth of being a male. No matter how much I delude myself, convince myself that I'm a female, you can't alter that absolute truth. And, and the absolute truth is a lot for the human mind to comprehend. I would say it's probably impossible for us to comprehend it. Much like the North Star in the sky at night is impossible to hold in the palms of our hands. Yet, it makes an excellent guiding light. Yeah. And do you believe that uh, God reveals a absolute moral truth for us to live our best lives? Or is, or is that up for debate? The, you know, uh, I think interpreting it would be up for debate, yet I do think God does have an absolute moral truth because he engineered us human beings. <laughs> as complex as we are, we are engineered, and we can live a crappy life, degenerate ourselves, or we can live a productive life with, with I think, the most valuable currency fulfillment, meaning, 
and love. And, and I think we get fulfillment, meaning, and love when we are abiding by the absolute moral truths. And I think the Ten Commandments would be a good example of those moral truths. I think our conscious conscience, it's not connected to our opinions. It's connected to the absolute objective truth of morality. I mean, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who can make a good case for, it's okay to kill someone if you're really angry. Probably not, because that, that very much violates the moral code that I don't think we create. I think God creates it for us. And I won't pretend to know the all, all, all you know, be all end all of the moral code, but I absolutely think there is one. And there's, you know, common sense, I think, does a pretty good job of um, leading us in that direction. Yeah. And I'd also be curious your take on does God have an absolute objective truth of moral code? Yeah, I do. And, uh, and it's found in the Christian faith, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. Like that's a tough one because that goes against our sensibility, right? Like that he would love us so much that he would become a man. Like God could contain, God could do anything. Right. And so they're just one of those weird truths that like requires an ascent to strength. I mean, uh, an ascent to faith, right? Because it's easy to say, well, don't kill someone. But then if you say Jesus Christ is Lord, it's like, well, that's, it might sound subjective, but if you raise yourself up and you believe God is who he says he is, uh, then, then it becomes objective. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? Like you, so you're Christian now, right? And it's like, you're a smart guy and I'm a questioning guy too. And a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these truths of the faith, I could, I couldn't rationalize. I can't, I can't put them together and say, okay, two plus two equals four. I've had to, I've had to allow myself or, or, or give myself over to God to raise me up to them. How do you handle things like that? Yeah, man, I'm not perfectly is the first part of the answer. And, you know, I, I think there's the intellectual handling of it. And then there's the actual living handling of it. And this does sound kind of airy fairy, but to me, it's pretty damn practical. The best way I know how to handle it and serving the truth, even though it might be a truth like my freaking mind right, a mystery. can't necessarily comprehend. Yeah, 100 percent. It's listening to our heart, listening to our gut feeling. So there could be something, hey, we're about to do this. And then I don't know, there's just like a, a heaviness in our heart when we think about choosing choice A. But choice B, OK, now there's a little bit of lightness or we, we say like, dude, I, I just can't explain it, but it just feels like B is the right thing to do. And I, I don't think our heart leads us wrong. I think our heart is basically uh, biofeedback of where are we navigating relative to the North Star direction of truth, objectivity, um, objective morality. And... By the way, I also think, at least my experience, a lot of times, the more I'm honoring my heart, the more scared my ego gets, the less comfortable it gets. So looking for that feedback as well, you know, it's like we're tracking a lion. We're kind of tracking God. And, you know, the feedback of like, oh, dude, choice B, man, this, this scares me. There's a lot of unknowns there. Um, I'd rather not do it. Dude, dude, that feels so uncomfortable. Oftentimes, I think that's excellent biofeedback that we're, we're going down God's path or the yeah. path that would best serve God and serve God's kingdom. So I, I don't think we're better off ignoring our heart, ignoring our gut feelings. Um, so I, I think Forrest Gump is a great analogy to to just think about in a practical way, because he was a guy just literally so dumb. His IQ was 60 something in the movie. So he didn't have the ability to follow his intellect. He just had the ability to follow his heart. 
and you know he's the archetype of the innocent his heart is compelled to oh let me join the army cool becomes a war hero saves people's lives and then like oh let me play ping pong becomes like the national champion let me play football becomes a national champion let me start this business okay i'll i'll do that and you know becomes very rich and i think that's all a metaphor done through hollywood of how we are rewarded and supported when we have the awareness of what our heart is saying, which is really what God's saying. I think our heart is the antenna and the courage to follow through. So I struggle with that a little bit. Like my heart is is wrong a lot of times. And you know, trying to trying to decode the heart, I think as I what I hear you saying a lot of saying as well. Uh and like I know, and you know, like so you're you're into you're a smart guy in terms of the body and stuff, and you know about the vagus nerve, right? And so the the polyvagal theory that the prefrontal cortex is somehow like tied to the heart, and like you got this one long cord that goes down and entangles them all, and then the and then the um the the attachment theory, right? Like the mirror neurons. And that if I'm, and so this idea and attachment there, and you have children. So when I, when I started having children, I was looking into like attachment parenting. That's where I learned all this stuff. Uh, I learned that like the countenance on your mother's face, which includes her trauma <laughs> and her trauma traumas, parents' traumas, uh, will literally imprint itself into the, as she's looking into the child's face, will imprint itself on the heart of that child by her not saying anything, not doing anything, but just the look on her face, he will mirror his mother's traumas. And then you go uh, later on in life and you watch Disney movies and they're telling you, oh, follow your heart, uh, which by the way was the mantra of uh, Alistair Crowley, who, you know, renowned Satanist. You know, the, he says, do what thou wilt will be the whole of the law. Uh, and then, like you got guys like Elliot Hulse and JP saying, "Follow your heart." One of my fav most famous videos is "Follow Your Heart." Uh, and then it's like, well, my heart is saying all kinds of crazy stuff that's not even mine. Plus, if, if you're anything like me, my heart is really impressionable. So, based on the music and movies that I watch, like I remember really thinking I was a gangster when I was a kid, and I would go and rob people because my heart told me to because I was listening to Tupac. And then, like, yeah. then, then. <laughs> so I struggle because then like the Bible and morality and uh, Christendom and like what we learn from religion uh, says, don't follow your heart, don't believe your heart. And even if you feel something, uh, you got to discern it and pay attention to what, say, scripture or tradition says. It's like, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, the way I look at it and, you know, kind of going into theoretical level here for a second, uh, I think our heart emanates pure truth. You know, God doesn't usually speak to us in English. Uh, Carl Jung has a saying that uh, feelings are the language of your soul. And I, I don't think he's talking about like your, your emotions. I think he's talking about like feelings that come from our heart. So... I do believe the, the heart's message, the heart's guidance is pure. Now, what kind of propaganda uh, inserts itself between your heart and your conscious mind? It's kind of like, okay, now we have CNN talking into our ears. And CNN is our mother's trauma, our father's trauma, our trauma, like all these things that can interfere with both the awareness of our heart and the interpretation. So at again, at a theoretical level, I think there is a distinction between our heart and other shit that comes in. And because follow your heart has become very popular vernacular. And I think a lot of times when we're following something, it's not our heart. It might be our mother's trauma. It might be our pure ego, which, just inserts itself and gets us to interpret it like, oh, they, uh, that's coming from my heart. So now I'm way more justified in doing what I'm doing. So again, very theoretical, yet that's how I look at it with a distinction. And that certainly means it can be very challenging 
following our heart because you just imagine there's a hundred people in this room. All of them are talking. Some of them have your best interest in mind. Some of them don't. And it's okay. Now we got a lot of noise. Who do I pay attention to? How do I hear the mm -hmm. actual source of truth? Um, I'm not going to pretend like that that's easy or I have some, or I'm perfect at it, or I have some end all be all, be all way of doing it. But what I can say is we are our best teachers. I think when it comes to this, where I guarantee we all have examples in our history where we've thought we were following our heart and it didn't work out well. Cool. Let's learn from that. How did I deceive myself? Mm. And we probably all have at least some examples of we thought we were following our heart and it turned out like we did. Like what happened was just beyond our imagination. Maybe we were scared, but it worked out really well. I, I saw God was actually supporting yeah. me on the other side of this chasm. So I think recognizing the nuances of like, what did I feel in, in that, that time where it probably was my heart? What, what did I feel? What was the sensations when I, when it didn't really work out so well? So I think looking at our past history and learning, kind of like watching the, the game film of our life and our decisions and debriefing and doing our best to learn. And, you know, I think it's clumsy at best, but it certainly beats the alternative of complacency. Yeah. It's, it's a tough question, right? Because there's like that balance between objectivity and subjectivity, right? Like we can't deny subjectivity. I mean, I was, I was denying objectivity completely when I learned about bioenergetics and the, the, the truth that the body speaks. And I'm like, you don't listen to the head at all. <laughs> I'm an extremist. <laughs> if you can't tell, you know, I go, I go from one end of the spectrum to the other. And that's, that's my heart, I guess. Right. Like I'm just being me. And I, I, I try to see myself objectively too. Like I go all in, but I get to look at myself and laugh. Like I'm crazy, but yeah. trying to find that. Which by the way, looking at yourself and laughing, saying you're crazy, dude, that's humbleness. It, man, we got to have that. Like the humbleness to say like, dude, I think I'm following my heart, but I could be wrong. Or dude, I, I thought I did, but I was definitely wrong. Let me laugh at myself. We got to have that humbleness. I think humbleness, yeah, humbleness is a bridge to God. Arrogance, certainty, mm -hmm. significant, cool, might feel godly, but I think those are disconnective mindsets that uh, well, take us away from God and uh, the guidance we could get you know, from God. Another one with uh, Emerson along the same lines, because again, this is where you and I are kind of the same. He says, uh, say what you say today with such conviction but even if you contradict yourself tomorrow, say it the same way. Like, just be all in with whatever you're doing. And I, I don't know, it's kind of been a, I resonate with that. It sounds good to me, but it's like, that's just who I am. So I'm like, yeah, that's that's gotta be right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm a Jesus freak now, right? So I went from uh, pot smoking, hippie, dreadlock, mohawk, uh, do do as you will and follow your heart. And um, I don't follow my heart anymore. <laughs> I don't believe my heart. My heart is freaking nuts. And so, um, but again, you know, I'm being silly because following my heart is what brought me to Christ. Uh, of all the religions, right? Because, you know, you're a new ager like me. And so, you know, we dabble in it all, right? And so I was, I was looking at, I, I was into Buddhism. I was into Hinduism. I loved reading the Bhagavad Gita. I even was uh, on a, a branch of Islam at one point. I was Baha'i. I mean, you know, again, just, just the way I am, you know, I get a little bit of ADD. But with all of the, all of the religions that are available to us, that whole cafeteria table, um, what brought you to Christ? Yeah, it is a beautiful accident. Like I, I never had and still don't have an intention of like, I'm going to become more right. Christian. Like, let's do that now. What I, uh, you know, really the pandemic is what did it for me. And what happened there from my delusional perspective is the presence of evil, the presence of Satan had never been more obvious in my lifetime, at least to my awareness. 
And a funny thing happens, like when you're in the presence of evil, seeing the evil going on in the world, you're going to do one of two things, go towards it or go away from it. And if you're not someone who's willing to metaphorically, if not literally, sell your soul and do the bidding of the devil, so in other words, if you don't receive the propaganda and obey the propaganda and then become a mass formation robot propagating it, then you're going to be moving away from the devil's work. So you have this polarity. I see evil. That's the devil. Not for me, bro. So the direction you're going, whether you consciously know it or not, that's the direction of God. And man, I've been, it's just been so beautiful. Certainly, you know, I'm grateful in my life, but I see so many people and I've talked to so many people who have the exact same story. Dude, over the last three years since they launched the pandemic, I've gotten more Christian and I didn't even mean to. What is going on? And I think it's just that evil is it's not hiding itself nearly as much as it used to. So I think people are just naturally being polarized towards God. And I think that's a great blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, like all the evil and tyranny, I'd certainly call that a curse in the world. But there's always blessings in the curses. Like how many people, you know, if the pandemic never happened, wouldn't be nearly as close to God, wouldn't be nearly as strong as a person. And, you know, I'm certainly one of those folks. So, you know, it's kind of like, screw you, evil tyranny. And also kind of thank you for helping me in my journey. Yeah. Um, you know, I started my heart and I'm going to contradict myself, started starting me, drawing me, started drawing me towards Christ about 2019. I was still sort of like in an in-between place. And, uh, I went and I visited one of our mentors, you know, Paul, Paul check, uh, still love him. Um, but he, Kind of, he kind of mocked me, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I didn't want to argue with him. I still saw him as like, you know, Master Paul. So I was like, well, okay, I know that you don't like this, and you're kind of making fun of me here, but um, I'm just gonna go with this. Uh, how, you know, I know you were close to him as well, and I don't know where he is now. I remember his first Instagram post was a picture of Baphomet. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, how do you, how do you work that out, or you know, what is what is your relationship to him in this way now? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm still grateful to be in touch with Paul. You know, we text every couple of weeks and have phone calls here or there. And, uh, you know, uh, my my experience of him is similar, uh, uh, similar in the sense of your experience where um, however he interprets Christianity, he doesn't like and he <laughs> sees that through his lens. And cool. Like I've I'll have my sense of self and it's like, cool, I have your interpretation. I'm 42 now. (laughs) If this was, you know, I met Paul when I was 20 and any mentor I had in my life, then I would have sacrificed my sense of self in order to do things their way, see things their way, because I was an approval addict. But turns out approval is a shitty, shallow currency. It's almost worthless. So now I'm, you know, I'm dysfunctional, I'm sure in many ways, but I'm not nearly as much of an approval addict. So one of the, I'll tell you, one of the things I love most that, I don't know, it just feels strengthening when there's a a mentor or someone I really respect and they have a different opinion. You might even judge my perspective, but I just feel solidified like, no, nope, that's still my perspective, uh, even though their approval ain't coming. So, but yeah, man, I, uh, I, I don't think religion is really his cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. They say to the sword goes but I love the master. Yeah. yeah. And that's a sign of maturity, you know, growing up. What, what, what was the precipice that took you to Jesus in 2019. Obviously, you you had experimented with everything under the sun, which I love. You kind of find out what works, mm-hmm. what doesn't work for you. I'd imagine all of that was somehow necessary for you 
to arrive where you arrived in 2019. But I'm curious if there was a particular precipice that led you towards Jesus. Man, you know, you hear like these mortigans who have like this amazing awakening experience and like Jesus came into my heart and transformed me instantly. That's not, that was not my experience at all. Uh, it started out as like practical seeking. Um, I knew that I needed to fast. I, that my heart was telling me like, you need to fast in order to find what I'm trying to show you. And, uh, and the fasting brought me to really, I wanted something Western. I wanted something, you know, I'm, I'm European, half European and half African, right? So, but I appreciate my European roots. You know, there was something that was growing in me that was saying, you know, all this demonization of white people ain't right. I want to, I want to know the truth about uh, Western civilization and I discovered Christendom. And so uh, it, through my fasting, uh, I, I, I moved from, you know, thinking that it was something that was reserved for Muslims and, and, and Hindus to there's got to be a, a, a Christian fa fasting tradition. I mean, really, that's what it was. I was like, where are, because I know there was Lent, because I, I grew up Catholic, like yourself. It was like make-believe Catholic. I knew there was Lent. <laughs> and so I started digging, and I got really, I got really uh, excited about the Orthodox faith, because I was like, okay, the roots of Christendom is found in the roots of the Christian faith. And the really old books like the Philokalia and like these old books of the Christian tradition, not necessarily the Bible, but like these extra Bible books and these traditions that have been handed on. You know, the, the, you're one of the mill Christian Protestant today. It's like, if it's Bible, if it ain't the Bible, it ain't true. Uh, but that's not, that's not what got us here. What got us here was, as Paul said, follow the traditions that we've shown you. The, easy, the thing is that if all you've got is a book, then you then you lose all the traditions and that the, with it went the fasting, and so uh, I started digging into orthodoxy, and uh, and learned about their their tradition of austerity and asceticism and fasting, and I learned about the desert fathers and you know the way these monks and hermits lived in the desert and man I was just I was so into that because I was like this is what God has been calling me to like I knew I needed to mortify myself. Uh, and humble myself because that's what fasting really is, is humble myself and so through the fasting i was still you know one of the things that new age did to me was get me hooked on substances like i was smoking weed like it was a like it was a sacrament <laughs> you know and we really believed that oh holy mother marijuana is a sacrament like all these other drugs that they get hooked on thinking that they're spiritual they're, they're medicines <laughs> elliot just don't call them drugs call them medicines <laughs> I'm going to throw up on that one, but give me a moment. Um, yeah, I, those medicines fucked up my brain, but I'm going to, I'm going to back up, backtrack on that one. So I was still smoking weed. Um, and, you know, one day, like, I'm, I'm, I'm deep in fasting. I'm sitting in my sauna, and I'm high as a kite. And it dawns on me that I'm a horrible person. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. It was just like this darkness set over me. And I, I just felt horrible about myself. And I never felt that way before because I'm generally a proud person. It's just my predisposition. I got a big ego and it's just who I am. Um, and, I, and I make excuses for myself. And it was for the first time that it was like, no, you're a sinner. And then I had like what's called an illumination of conscience. And in that moment, like I started like all the sins that I didn't think were sins because I justified them just started like like a rotary dex going through my brain. It was like from the time I was even a teenager, like you did this, you did this, you did this, you did that. And I'm like, oh, man. And it wasn't that Jesus was the furthest thing in, from my mind at the, at the moment, but like I was still just kind of exploring. I was like, well, I like this. I like this tradition. I like these ascetic practices. I like being, being, feeling like I'm a part of something old, but I'm not so sure about Jesus yet. And I knew that I needed to do something about these sins. I was like, I felt dirty. I was like, how am I going to get this off of me? And I was not looking. I was not looking to be Catholic. It was the furthest thing from my mind. I was baptized Catholic, and I know you were also. And I like to say it's our baptismal grace is kicking in. It's like a ticking time bomb. Yeah, and that's why they do, now I understand why they do infant baptism. 
because they baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You get you get that graces then, and then no matter how far you go, if you're open, that ticking time bomb goes off, and it literally went off in that moment for me. And God, the wow. Holy Angel, or something that was in that sauna with me, because the whole sauna fried. I I I, I had. I had to fix it afterwards. It was the weirdest thing. Like sparks went off and it fried. And it said, go and confess your sins. Go confess, Elliot. It was not only how I became Christian, because I was I was going I was edging towards orthodoxy. I became I came back to being Catholic because I was like, go confess my sins. To who? Where? What is like I remember doing that when I was like 10 years old because I had to, because my parents made me. And it just dawned on me in that moment. It's like, all this seeking, Elliot, that you've been doing for yourself all these years, uh, now it's time to come home. You're Catholic. Mm. And I, I don't want to say I resisted it, but I was like, I don't know anything about that, nor am I interested in knowing anything about that. But I'm going to go, and I'm going to receive this sacrament. And, man, <laughs> the graces of God poured in almost instantly and i could see where satan was trying to stop me from going into confession that day i was high that day i went to confession and uh and there was a good reason why i almost left because you know the, the confession time was over and the priest walked out and I, and I was the last person there i was like the i was the last one to go and he said wait till after mass and i didn't listen i walked out and i walked out and again you know some holy angel guardian angel tapped me on the cho shoulder I was like, get your ass back in there. I went down, I sat down, and man, it was so that's you asked me. So I try I try not to rant too much on my own show, but um yeah, that's what happened. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. And I'm curious, you, like the the graces of God, you being tapped on the shoulder, and your awareness in the sauna, like I'm always curious, like, how does that show up? Is it yeah, how, how does it show up, whether it's your mind, your body? I follow my heart. <laughs> well, it was, man, it's a sense, bro. It's a sense. It's kind of crazy. And you know what? When I talk, when I say don't follow your heart, I, it, the, the fact is that if I'm following my heart and I'm following my heart and I'm sinning, that's how I know I'm not following my heart. And so this, the, the moral code of the church and what they call out as sins, I now – no, I'm not following my heart. If I'm high, I'm not following my heart. There's a lot of guys who are like hooked on drugs, jerking off, and uh, you know, doing all kinds of stuff, and, you know, with with their medicines. And it's like I'm not so sure that's your heart, bro, because your intellect is darkened right now. And I don't think God made us in such a way that we needed to shut off our brains to hear the truth. I think we need to be fully integrated in the moment. And I'm not so sure these drugs uh, integrate you. I think in a lot of ways they disintegrate you. And maybe you experience something in a disintegrated state that you, you maybe you needed to see, but you're not you're not fit to make decisions when you're when you're high or you're on you know mama ayahuasca or something like that. So that's what I've discovered. And so with that though, uh, I've assented to faith in all that the Catholic Church teaches. And so I you know I have one basic Christian question for you because you know. We're new Christians, you, you and I both. And I think for you, maybe a little bit newer, but I, I got like a couple of years on you in age too. So no, I'm I'm a better Christian than you, <laughs> Elliot. Come on. Let's... Well, here's one that I struggled with, but like it's taken me even 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 as I walked that faith, I was like, I, okay, this is gonna take some time. And so I ask you, because you know I hear you like me, man. Like you're using it like I I used to be. And I used to almost be afraid to say the name Jesus Christ. And I know why now I, am, I was afraid to say Jesus, uh, because there's an antichrist spirit in the world that teaches us to, to cringe at his name. And I did for many years. I cringed at his name, and it took me a long time to be able to say Jesus Christ with the confidence and strength that I can right now. And even when it came to God, like I watched your video, and you're talking about how you know we would use terms like, oh, uh, infinite intelligence or the universe. And, you know, one step closer is to say, to actually say God. But I'm curious, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Yeah, I, I do. And I'll, I'll fill in some, some additions to that after I just <laughs> yes. say, yes, I do. Um, when I hear people talk about, hey, I've accepted Jesus into my life, 
I haven't. And, and I, you know, wish I could say I had, but I just like to be honest, like I, I, I haven't had an experience where that feels profound. I've actually, I've been asking people, how did that work for you? How did Jesus show up? What was like your, for people that aren't just doing a lip service, but people who have had an actual experience of receiving Jesus into their life, I've been asking like, how how did you do that? Because I'm curious about it because I just authentically can say, yeah, that hasn't happened to me. I could intellectually say that, but I don't think that really makes it a very true experience. Mm -hmm. But do you believe that Jesus is God incarnate, like intellectually? Because I know there's that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because that's where it is too. Here's the other thing too, bro. And I, you're Catholic, whether you know it or not. So I know you're calling yourself Christian, but you're Catholic. The Catholic tradition. The graces of my baptism. Yeah. Gary, Catholic. And here's why I know that you will love Catholicism because it's an intellectual tradition. It is highly intellectual and is, you know, and you could take this one way or another, but it's suspect of feeling. And when it comes to Protestantism, man, it's a lot of feeling. It's, you know, raise your hands and feel Jesus. And, you know, the, then if you don't have this feeling experience, which I think is also uh, very akin to the new age type stuff, where if I'm not having an experience of Jesus or an experience of God, or I don't feel him that he's not there, when the Catholic tradition is very clear that you don't need to or shouldn't seek any feeling at all. Faith has no feelings, <laughs> has no feelings. It's an ascent. It's it's a, it and, it, and to ascend, like of course, is has means it's above, it's above intellect, reason. So for most Christianity, uh, you know, run of the mill, it's they their Christian faith is here, which is in the heart. I'm not saying the heart is bad, but there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. And the Christian and the Catholic tradition is highly intellectual. Like, have you have you heard of Thomas Aquinas? I yeah. Have, yeah. So I mean, the I mean, it, he just he takes Aristotle and just raises it ten times with Jesus Christ and adds the theological virtues. But um, if you and I know you're you're you know you're an intelligent guy, you're a smart guy. Like I I respect that about you. Like I watch, I listen to you and I'm like this guy is so smart. So like I I I, I like um, I honor that in you. If you ever wanted to dig in, man, what really got me with the Catholic faith was how freaking smart it is. I mean, there's an answer for everything that makes you not just say, well, I believe because I feel. It says, no, 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 here's the reason. And here, here are the 10 doctors and philosophers and theologists from 1500 years ago that tell you exactly why. And when you start digging into the ancient traditions of the faith, you realize this stuff is not just made up or felt, it's, intelligent and you mentioned beauty before there's no and i'm you know i'm evangelizing here with you but you know do what you want <laughs> there's no greater beauty than western christian which is catholic art i mean all the art all the cathedrals all the greatest artists like art started really getting shitty after the protestant revolt Couple of questions for you, Elliot. Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> so, and I realize this is it's a big question in such a like finite space, but nonetheless, I want to throw it at you anyway. So, if you were giving someone guidance on how to accept Jesus into their life, what would that sound like? You know, I love that you brought up prayer, right? Like because. So Aquinas has three theolo theological virtues. The first is faith, hope, and charity. Those are the first, the three of them, but faith. It's really hard to assent to even the fact that there's a God if you're not willing to just live in a mystery, like live in the question, right? It's like, you know what? You don't need to know. That's another like brain cramp and one that I had to get over. It's like, you know what? I don't actually have to know in order to believe. Right? And I don't have to have an answer. And so we live in this world where like, if you, don't have a, if you don't have an answer that satisfies your critics' questions, well then you, then you, don't, you don't give yourself permission to go that way. 
And so with faith, if I'm praying, right? I love that you said prayer because you can't pray if you don't have faith. Even if you have a mustard seed of faith to say, okay, and this is what I tell people, like, you know, if they have, if they're completely atheist or like agnostic and they're like, I don't even know what to do. I say, you know what? Just like a baby, just ask, like, God, I don't even know if you exist. I don't know if I want to believe in you. I don't know if I'm talking to myself or I'm talking to somebody or I don't, I don't know anything. I'm completely ignorant. But if you're true and what you say is true, then guide my steps. Put it in front of me what you want me to see, what you want me to do. I'll be open to you. And I'm looking for things. I'm looking for things related to God, right? I don't want a sign out of the sky. I want something that's tangible, right? Like when you ask for something, you ask specifically. If I'm gonna ask for something, I wanna ask specifically, right? And so you could ask specifically. So that's just, that's the first, right? Like the first thing is like you gotta open up to faith. We can't talk about Jesus if you don't believe in God, right? So it's like, Jesus is a, li more, a lot more intellectual I think you can get to. I think you get to Jesus a little quicker than I think you can get to God, at least I can, because God, well, Aquinas says that God is logical and that you can come to God's uh, existence through, he's got like these, I'm not going to talk too much because I don't remember it anyway, but he's got these three arguments. You should read the, the, the uh, Summa Theologica, which is, a, it, it's like three volumes of books where he literally just, it's Q and A. It's, does God exist? Mm -hmm. And then he gives the reasons why people would say no. And then he, and then he gives a, he gives bullet point answers to here's why he does exist. Here's why he does exist. Here's why he doesn't. Next question. And then the whole thing is just broke, broken down that way. So if you're an intellectual, read the intellectual traditions of the faith. Go read the Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas. You don't need faith to read the, uh, to read the Summa Theologica. Like it's, and his whole thing is reason. He brought faith in with reason, but his whole practice is reason. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for that resource, man. And um, second, oh question, man, how did this happen? I'm just ranting a lot. You know what, dude? Bro, Honestly, um, I'm ranting a little bit because, like, I, <laughs> I knew we were gonna get in this call, and I love you so much, and I think we have so much in common. And we have such a great time every time we do talk. And I was trying my best not to, not to like evangelize and be like, JP's Catholic. JP's Catholic, and he just doesn't know how awesome <laughs> that is. <laughs> and he's playing around with this Mickey Mouse Christianity. I'm gonna get him. <laughs> no, I love it, man. I man, I so respect you and your perspectives. I know it all comes from love. So I just know I love it. And, and I'm also wondering the past few years, you know, you found Jesus and you're obviously continuing down that path of deepening your faith. I'm curious how your family has responded. Your wife, your children, are they right there with you or are they in a different place? And if so, just how that Okay, works. let's do this. Let's be fair. You answer that question for you first because that's a big one that I get a lot of people wanting to know. Yeah, how did your wife uh, re receive that? Like, was she Christian first? I'll answer after you. But yeah, tell me how it was when you yeah. decided that you were going to follow the way, right? Like, because there is no, like you and I both, it's like a process. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden I'm a Jesus freak. But how was it that yeah. you, when you started down down that path, uh, the people in your life, uh, particularly your wife, uh, received that? Yeah, you know, uh, for context, she's much like me. She was very indoctrinated in the new age spiritual world and yeah, cool. Um, and and I, I do believe she's unraveling some of the propaganda, uh, much like I do my best to do as well. Um, and I'll also say in context, my um, my current search, I'm relatively quiet about it. Not like a dude, I'm I'm ashamed or I'm embarrassed, not at all, but just more of I'm an introvert and things are so new to me and my figuring out process. I just get quiet about things. So her and I have some conversations, but not a lot about them. And and my my experience of her is she's just she's not yet into it. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to I've got so many friends who have given me, like, for example, good church recommendations 
in our area. I want to start experimenting. You just see what they have to offer. They don't have the sacraments. Um, go to, only go to a church that has a sacrament. Sacraments where Jesus Christ is in the Holy Eucharist. Got. It. All right, I'll stop. Sorry. Gotcha. And so, with that said, um, though I haven't acted on it yet, I will. But I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if my wife says. Eh, cool. You go check that church out. I'm going to stay home. We'll see. And I'll certainly encourage without pushing like, Hey, come with me. Just let's check this out together. Um, but I, I think her, she's just in a, a slightly different spot. I don't mean that bad or good or some passive yeah, aggressive no. way of saying, dude, I'm actually more involved, evolved. Um, but there, you know, there's, I will say this with, when it comes to, my current faith and the evolution of it, where she's at, we don't have friction or conflict there. And like, you know, she's been a vegan for many years. I am a hundred percent, not a vegan. Mm -hmm. And we we've just managed, I think so well to not have like different ideologies be a source of conflict or division for us. So uh, we've got that foundation, which I just, I, I think the the current road we're on, it it just makes it for like, cool, that this isn't going to be division. It'll be unity, if anything. And then I will say, you know, uh, with my mom, me doing my best to find God and pursue that path, that's brought her and I closer together. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, you and I were both raised Catholic or at least yeah. pretend Catholic going through the motions. My mom, you know, when she was a kid, she went to Catholic school. It was very, it was a very big part of her life. And she still goes to church every week, if not multiple times a week to this day. So her and I now have much more common ground. And, you know, of course she's happy and joyful seeing me where I'm at. So uh, that's certainly been a, a beautiful thing. And my, my dad's an atheist, so he probably thinks I'm a nut job, but I probably am a nut job for various reasons, so he might be right. Yeah, what a mix in this day, man, to have a family that's Catholic and atheist. <laughs> <laughs> but it's where we're at, man. But I'll tell you, as a, a kid and growing up, I appreciated that mm -hmm. diversity of thought in my household. You know, my neither my mom or dad are dumb people, so they both have reasons for their their mm -hmm. beliefs their faith their lack of faith and i enjoy like learning about their reasons it's just i think it's helped me be more intellectual and develop a little bit better discernment than i'd have or in critical thought than i'd have if i had a different yeah. mom and dad i watched a video of you uh about you know answering a, a question from a catholic kid it was seven years ago and uh you haven't aged very gracefully at all you you were looking pretty damn young in that picture man Dude, I've aged like 20 years in the past yeah. two years. You know what happens? It, you and I both, man. Like all of a sudden the grays show up like one year. There's, it's, it's black or for you it's red. And the next year it's like gray. It's like, what the heck? I know it. And it ain't man. And I, you know, wrinkles <laughs> on my face. And... Ginger problems. <laughs> Ginger problems indeed. The sun's racist. Mm -hmm. The sun is deliberately hurting me because of my albino skin tone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard that uh, lack of melanin is a, um, a birth defect. So white people are probably from another, another planet. Man, we might be. <laughs> but, uh, so how's it been for you and your oh, family? Oh, okay. Yeah, let me let me get to that real quick. But I was bringing up the um, the video because you said something in there that really lends to where you and I find ourselves today. And even though you said it seven years ago, you're talking about how like most people just, you know, they are living the faith of their parents because that's what their parents wanted them to do. And I'm so grateful, and I'm sure you would agree, it's your, probably your experience as well, that like, no, I rebelled. I didn't do what my parents told me to do. Um, even if they were right, I wouldn't have listened to them. And it makes it that much more real uh, that I've chosen the faith, you know what I mean? Rather than it being something that... Yeah. Oh, well, you know, you're just doing what your dad did and your granddad did. So my parents, they kind of laugh at me, actually. My dad teases me for being a Catholic. I'm like, dude, you're the one that made me Catholic. Like, it's your fault. And so, you know, I'm actually, I was doing the opposite of them then, and I'm doing the opposite of them now. Because, you know, I, like, I pray for them, but I, 
they're you know they're like well we're i think we're catholic but i don't know about all that stuff <laughs> yeah i i you know I, I i i like that you brought that up i think the idea of someone just i'm following this faith because that's what my parents did and i've just always done that probably nothing wrong with that but I think there's something to be said, like if you have $20 million in the bank because you're a trust fund baby, your parents, your grandparents earn that, cool, but there's a different meaning with that money and you've developed different things within yourself if that $20 million in the bank is because you worked your ass off for it. Mm -hmm. So I think finding faith of your own accord, even if it happens to be the same faith as your parents or a different faith, but that faith of our own accord, I think just it carries more richness yeah. for us. I'll get to the, my family in a question in a, in a second. But, you know, one of the things also that I was I was searching for when I came back to the faith was, again, you know, I was I was fascinated with Western civilization and I was it was a shame to see what was happening to it. Uh, it was kind of around the time Trump became president and he kind of like inspired me, too. I was like, oh, this guy's making America great. Like America is great. Like and I started becoming a big American fan. And, you know, what that started leading me to was like the roots of Western civilization. And I realized that, you know, patriotism comes from the word patriarch, where we get patriarchy, where we get the word uh, paternity, where we get the word father. And, you know, all this seeking and searching that most men do, and I know I deal with a lot of young men, uh, I started to live by the mantra of seek your father's faith. Like, you know, if, if you don't know, a lot of men will ask me, like, I don't know what religion to follow. And this was, you know, now I'll tell them, well, Jesus Christ is Lord, and there's only one true religion in the Catholic faith. But when I was trying to figure that out, I would say, well, what is your father? Like, go back to the, the word father comes with the word pattern, right? Like, what is your pattern, right? And if your dad's an atheist, like, well, what was his dad? And what was his dad? And what was his dad? I get you, I bet you somewhere down the line, there was a Christian. And I bet you if you go a little further back, there was a Catholic. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So finding ourselves, you know, it's like it's it like the like the story of uh, is it Parsifal or anyway the the, the the alchemist. You know, you always finding yourself means coming back home. And I, I started realizing that, like, I just need to go home. But as far as my family is concerned, my wife, um, I'm a I'm a psychopath, so I just make her do whatever I'm doing. <laughs> you better you gotta follow me, and then you know I. I whip all my kids until they listen. No, that's not that's not the case at all. But uh, Colleen and I have been together since we were teenagers, and I have a really good track record with her. I'm eccentric, and she's very stoic. And uh, anytime I've gone on an eccentric gallivant, uh, she slow steps, but she trusts me. And she's gone with me down some, you know, some path she wouldn't follow me and I wouldn't I didn't ask her to because I'm like I, I like new age and when I was smoking weed I was like I know I'm wrong and she's like you know I even you know I, I, was, I was such a bad person you know, like I tried to make her do it too and she was stoic and she was strong she's like I am not smoking that shit <laughs> but you know so I've I've had a good track record but I've made some mistakes and coming out of my you know mistaken era and then all of a sudden uh showing up one day and I'm like I, I told her, I was like, you know, you're Catholic, right? And she's like, what are you getting at? And she's like, oh, no. Oh, no. You're not becoming Catholic now, are you? I was like, okay, hold, slow down, right? And she's like ready to just run. She's like, no, 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 no. I was like, listen, you don't have to do anything. I was like, you just be you. Just don't mock me. Because there was at one point, like, cause she didn't realize that I was serious. And she said something that was kind of, kind of mocking, like, you know, uh, because she didn't, she just didn't understand. I was like, just, you don't have to do what I have to do, what I'm doing, just let me be, let me be. And I knew, because I knew this was true, that it was only a matter of time that she came through as well. Uh, and it, it took about a year. And I was going to mass every day. And I was praying the rosary every day. And I was reading the Bible every day. And I discovered the catechism. You know what the catechism is? Uh, no, I, I've heard the word. Catechism but I, is a I book that contains all of the tradition and reference to scripture of the ancient faith, the Catholic faith. It like every and now my wife studies this catechism better than I do. She studies it every morning. But there was a there was a there was a, a latency period where uh, I was just diving in with two feet like I normally do and letting her be, um, you know, and I, there was no pressure at all. 
and she would ask questions and I'd have a good answer to the question because I was studying, right? I wanted to be able to answer her questions and she, and she doesn't, she knows that I don't do anything unless I, I go f like all in. And so she knew that like, I wasn't going to be a dummy about it and I wasn't just going to like fall into something because I felt like it, like there was going to be, I was, I was going to have an answer. And so she would start asking really good questions. And then I would ask her, hey, it's Easter. Uh, do you want to go? Do you want to go to mass? Okay. Come with me to mass. And then I started teaching her about the faith. I was like, well, I'm going to go receive the Holy Eucharist, but you can't. What do you mean? I'm Catholic. I was like, well, you're in a state of mortal sin because you haven't gone to confession since you, since forever. And she's like, oh, well, that's not fair. I was like, well, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to be here, we're going to do it right. And so she started getting curious, like, well, it, like, because I, she didn't know about the faith. And so she, better questions started coming and then, you know, books started arriving and then, you know, gr the conversations deepened and, um, and just over time. So I guess that was 2019. Um, in 2022, last August, uh, we, it was our 20 year marriage wedding anniversary and we convalidated our marriage in the church because we got married, you know, we got married on a boat, you know, back when we were teenagers because, you know, anything but the church, right? I'm going to do it different. So we were married, you know, outside somewhere. None of our children were baptized. So that very Easter, all of our children were baptized and like my whole family was brought into the into the faith uh, three years later. I'll tell you what it what I did a lot of was praying. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I didn't pray like like I need this. I prayed like I have the patience to wait until this unfolds the way it's supposed to unfold because I know this is your path for me. And uh, and so she's I don't say she's a better Catholic than me, but she is. She's a better she's a better Catholic than me. And the crazy thing is, bro, God works in such mysterious ways. Both of us were baptized Catholics as babies, which were, and we were both make believe Catholics. You know, we call them cafeteria Catholics, which is like, oh, you know, you're kind of Catholic, but you're not. You're not well catechized. That's the word that they use to mean that you're deepened in the faith. You don't know anything about the faith. And I didn't know anything about the faith. But when we got to college, she went to a Jesuit college, and it, so it was Catholic. Um, but we weren't Catholic. Uh, but she knew she wanted to marry me and all she knew about marriage was that like well when you get married like you have to you, you have to uh, do it in the church like we didn't know any better it was like we weren't catholic but we just figured oh you get married in church so she went and received all of her sacraments she became you know she was baptized as a baby she didn't get all the rest of the sacraments like i did when i was a teenager like uh confirmation and you know first communion and stuff like that and the crazy thing I was her sponsor when she was a freshman in college, which technically makes me her godfather. <laughs> I'm my wife's godfather. Was that for a power play in the relationship? <sighs> That's how I knew she had to listen to her daddy. But I didn't realize that until a family member told me this about two months ago. She was like, you know that you, you oh, know that you're her godfather? I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, you were her sponsor uh, at you know, her Holy Communion and all that. And so, yeah, man, um, it was, it's an amazing, it's an amazing journey. And uh, like I said, Colleen is like, she gets up every morning, she reads her Bible, she prays her rosary, and she reads the catechism. She spends more time on her knees than I do. And I, I didn't do it. I didn't make it happen. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, man. And the, and the kicking in of those baptismal graces. Yeah, baptismal graces. I, I love that you put that word on my radar baptismal graces there's yeah that's rich i'm i'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing what shows up that i can recognize as baptismal did graces. you receive the other sacraments like were you uh, confirmed and received communion yeah i did you know baptism when i was a baby in the catholic church and then first communion when i was i don't know what seven years old or so yeah and that's about as far in the progression cool. as we want. Hey, uh, I would encourage you, like, so the Catholic faith has had a split. In the 1960s, there was, like I told you, the infl infiltration. And one of the main things that changed in the faith was the change in the liturgy and the way the faith was practiced. And it was, it's crazy. It's a huge scandal in the church right now. And it's the cause for most of the division and the misunderstanding that's happening in the church. Um, so, you know... 
do what you want, but it would be, I think it would be beneficial to like go and do a confession, right? Like I had to go on YouTube and figure out how to do this again. You know, three years ago, I was like, confession, how am I going to do that? Like I had to learn the act of contrition and all that. But like it's called, Catholics believe it's a second baptism. So when you're baptized, you of course, you're, you're washed clean and filled with the Holy Spirit. But what Catholics believe, which is the tradition of the faith, unlike some Christians that believe, like, you know, once saved, always saved, is that you actually can accumulate dirt and you can fall out of grace. <laughs> Go figure, right? So, so as a baby, you're baptized, but, like, you're going to sin and it's going to muddy you up. And you got to you got to get a bath every once in a while. You got to clean all that stuff up because it's going to affect you spiritually. It's going to block you. Aquinas says that it sin darkens the intellect. So there are things that God wants to wants to give you certain graces, but it's dense with sin. So by going to confession, that absolution removes all the sin. It's like you get a second baptism and then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but then you're opened up to an influx of grace. And so that's the first place to begin. The reason why I brought up the, you know, the split in the church, they call it, you know, the it's, they, it happened at Vatican II, which was in the 1960s when the sexual revolution happened and most of the shifts in all of culture happened. There's a saying that as goes the church, so goes the culture. So as the church started to split and fall apart into liberalism and modernism, so did the rest of the world. But if you do decide to explore your faith, um, I would encourage you to go check out a traditional Latin Catholic church, a traditional Catholic church, which is different than the Novus Ordo, which is probably the one that you and I grew up in, um, you know, uh, which is, you probably remember the liturgy somewhat, but it's the, it's the liturgy that was created in the 1960s, which was kind of a hippie liturgy. But if you go to a traditional Latin Catholic church, you don't even have to be Latin, but a traditional Catholic church, you're looking for the traditional liturgy, uh, it's a 2,000 year old tradi uh, liturgy that carries all the graces of 2,000 years of tradition. And it's like, that's why I started learning Latin. Like, it's, it, a lot of it's in Latin. There's a lot of uh, ceremony and ritual that's really rich with spiritual power and graces. And if nothing else, entertaining because it's, it's not like you're going to hear a sermon. Catholics don't go to church to get, to, to get something. Right. Like, you know, people say, I'm going to go to church. I don't get anything. Right. Oh, the, the pastor didn't give a good sermon today. Catholics go to church to give something. So it's, you, it's uniting our suffering with Christ at the at the at the uh, at the altar. So when we go, it, if you go to a traditional Latin church, it's it's all giving. And so it's a little painful. <laughs> it's not euphoric. It's like, you know, you're 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 going there to have remorse, which is another thing that I kind of appreciated was like, I'm so prideful and egotistical that I needed some go somewhere and remind me like, get on your knees and stick out your tongue, you dirty bastard. <laughs> Man, well, I appreciate that perspective. I, I will do my best to find a, a, a traditional Catholic church in the area. And, but I appreciate knowing those distinctions because I, I didn't know about the scandal in the 1960s. And so, man, I appreciate the enlightenment. Dude, I appreciate talking to you. You're, it's so much fun chat with you, man. Oh, bro. Yeah, I, I, I wish we had all day, every day. And, man, uh, one thing I, I will have to say, whether you want to hear it or not, which has served as a, a great inspiration for me uh, over the past, I don't know, couple of handfuls of years, anytime I'm changing my mind about something, whether it's gun control or faith in God or abortion, I look at back, man, it might've been 2014, maybe 2013, give or take. And I looked at you, this is before you and I ever talked, but I looked at you and your strength camp YouTube channel. You had just crossed a million subscribers, which especially back then, that was hard to do. Still hard to do today, but it was just like, man, you're killing it. Getting tons of views. And then you stop making YouTube videos. And I was just like, what the heck? Uh, what's what's wrong with Elliot? But I watched you and then watched your the different iterations of philosophies, roles, practices that you would then do. And that's inspired me to 
be as as true to myself as I can be without being governed by the fear of losing what I have. I have to keep being what I've been in order to keep what I have, which is a crappy way of living, but it's fear based. It's tempting to do. But just seeing how, you know, your pursuit of truth, you're just willing to let it all fall away. Not that it all fell away, but it looked like you were willing to do that and and not just stay pigeonholed. Here's what I need to be because here's what gets me external validation, approval, fame, money. So, man, I, I just want you to know that's that was incredibly touching for me. And it has positively influenced me uh, many ways, man. So I, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, with you. thank you, man. You know, uh, it's, it's a gift and it's a curse. And I, I, you know, I was driving here and I was thinking about you and it was the exact opposite. I was thinking, man, JP's been super consistent since the time. I remember, you know, I spoke on the phone once and you were like, hey, I'm thinking about doing YouTube. What do you think? I was like, hey, yeah, okay, cool. And since that time, you just, you've just been putting one foot in front of the other, getting better little by little and being consistent. And so in that way, uh, the opposite way, like I appreciate you. Sometimes I think like, what if I just stayed consistent? What if I, and not to say that I would have been doing it against my own conscience, but like, what if I just kept doing what I was doing, but just got a little bit better rather than stepping off completely and going left field? And I'm not saying that in a comparative way or that I shouldn't have done that, but like I admire that in you. I was like, because I know one of the things also, and you know, I'm still a little bit of a new agey, we're both Aries. And, and as an Aries, like we're spontaneous and we're fiery and you know, we're, we're, we're courageous. And I was like, man, that kind of hurt me in a way but JP's like, he held that fire and he held it strong and he's still going. So it goes both ways, brother. Well, thank you for that. I guess each of our dysfunctions, when you put us together, we kind of make one functional human being. <laughs> hey, man, uh, you know, before we part ways, uh, you're and that's another thing, man. You're you're really busy. Like you still doing tours. You're still uh, where, where are you touring next? What, what kind of tour are you on? Like where can people go and see you live because that's so cool yeah right on well yeah i'm I, i'm kind of on a never-ending tour uh, which is basically two weekends a month i'm traveling around to do live stand-up comedy shows hopefully giving people a lot of laughs and making them think a little deeper along the way so yeah my website you can find out my full tour it's always cities being added, but awakenwithjp.com. And I think I'm in Spokane, Washington next, uh, and a bunch of different places. I'll be back in uh, Tampa, I think this fall. And I know you're not right there in Tampa, but I'll give you a shout if there's a chance for yeah, us to please do. find a way to get together and be plowed, proud Floridians together. That's That'd right. Cool. You're in uh, Texas though, right? Yeah, I live about an hour outside of Austin. Nice, man. And so uh, I don't think anybody who's watching this doesn't know who you are, but definitely go watch JP on YouTube. Uh, how many subscribers you got now on your YouTube channel? I think uh, on my main channel, like 2.8 million Amazing. or so. Amazing, cool. And on Facebook, you're on Instagram, putting up workout videos. I love that. Cool, man. Yeah, dude, I... Got to keep it real. And for me, I, I love to um, put myself through discomfort physically because it teaches me well, better to have the courage to do that where it counts more mentally and what you stand for. So, but yeah, I appreciate that. I, I have fun with it in like fitness. It's, yeah. it's my roots. So it just feels good to once in a while like hey for fun here's me well crushing myself with squats yeah, or whatever and staying lean bro you're ripped well, you got thank it. you elliot i was waiting for you to acknowledge it awesome well thank you jp thank you for everybody for listening and uh this has been an amazing show we'll be back next time with another amazing guest that's it that's all talk soon done if you're a high achieving businessman executive or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. <laughs>